Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Commander Pod, your Magic Gathering podcast for all things Commander. My name is Kelton Hell. And I'm Spencer Simpson. As always, thank you so much for listening, and please make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on our weekly content. This week, we'll be talking about how you can play Commander without losing your friends, <laughs> or when to play optimally, and versus making friendly plays in Commander. Yeah, this is kind of a funny conversation because with any game, you're trying to win, right? But Commander is a casual format, and that's so different than most other formats in Magic. I guess besides Commander and things like maybe Canadian Highlander and things like that, are there what other f- casual formats are there besides like Kitchen Table Magic? I can't really think of any. What this makes me feel like I want to compare it to is like other board games. Like when you, mm-hmm. I feel like Commander is the cl- the closest to playing other board games with friends. Yeah, but it's Magic, so you get to play like the funnest board game and card game of all time, right? Yes. It's just, it's just with other board games. I also feel like I want to win, but somehow the fun is inherently built in, and no one gets like their f- yeah. The level of interaction in other card games is significantly less, so no one gets their feelings hurt in that sense. But that's what makes Magic so cool. So Commander's a cool intersection of trying to win and learning how to play well, but also trying to optimize factors beyond winning, like having fun because it's a casual format. Yeah, exactly. We talk about this a lot in our Power Levels episode, so be sure and go check that out. But like Kelton said, part of Commander being a largely casual and social format means that we want to create a fun and social experience for all four of the players. And that's why we have things like Rule Zero Conversations. Yeah, and it's also part of the reason why people generally don't play certain cards in Commander, especially in casual pods. There are cards that are considered salty and that can really disrupt the other three people at the table trying to play their decks. You brought up a few examples when we were talking earlier of (coughs) cards that we play sparingly and usually not in the command zone. Mm -hmm. Cards like Turgrid, God of Fright, which is usually played as a discard deck to try and make all of your opponents discard their cards and not have any cards in hand. Or Elesh Norn, Mother of Machines, which prevents your opponents from uh, having ETB triggers. Or Corvold, Fey Cursed King, which is, you know, such a boogeyman and really monopolizes the game clock a a lot. Yeah, and again, these are really powerful cards, but I think the important thing is that people typically aren't playing them in the command zone. I play... I don't think I have a deck with Turgrid in it currently, and I have mm-hmm. a deck that I've brewed but not built that plays Elesh Norn. Yep. But I do play Corvold in one of my Jund decks because it is just a yep. powerful Jund card. But I'm not playing it as the commander, meaning I don't have access to it every game, and I'm not built around abusing it specifically, which yeah. does make it feel less salty. And I think that probably could go for Turgrid and Elesh Norn as well. Even yeah. though they are very powerful cards, they're powerful cards that you find in your deck to win the game, not powerful, salty cards that you've built around and are abusing. Definitely. I mean, that's how Turgrid was in the deck. I used to have Turgrid in the deck. I don't have Turgrid in the deck currently, um, but it's because it had a wheel sub theme, and the deck didn't really have <laughs> a way to close out the game other than wheeling and stealing all of my opponent's permanents and then being able to finish the game. So it was kind of the win con in the deck. Yeah, I feel like that's something to keep in mind with all salty cards that people play is like people have to have powerful ways to close out the game. One of my favorites that is one of my playgroup's least favorites is Toxel the Corrosive. I play a lot of (laughs) Demir decks and Toxel Go is a really great finisher for Demir decks. And it's not... I think that what makes it sometimes salty is it's not quite like an instant finisher, but it... Yeah, it's it can be a slow burn. It usually yeah. finishes up a game pretty quickly, but occasionally there will be a game when nobody has anything on the board. We're all maybe have high life totals, and we see Tox Roll, and we're like, can anybody do anything about Tox Roll? No? Okay, we'll just scoop and go to the next game. Like, <laughs> you got this one. We don't have to sit through at every turn. We know we know that we've lost. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In any case, it is a tough balance to figure out when to play optimally and when to play, you know, somewhat suboptimally because you're trying to help other people have fun. Because, like, for me, as much as I want my friends to have fun and have their decks do the thing, I also want to win the game. Yeah. So when should you play suboptimally? And we're going to provide you with some of our answers that we had as we were discussing it, but we'd really like to hear from you in the comments as well. So let us know, when do you choose to play suboptimally? Um, yeah, for, go ahead. Yeah, for us, uh, we're going to give you some, some uh, examples of that. But I think before we start, it's worth clarifying that when we're talking about playing optimally or suboptimally, 
it, we're always playing <laughs> optimally, really. It's just that we're optimizing for different things. Sometimes we're yeah. optimizing for our win rate and winning the game. And other times we're optimizing for people having fun. So in this context today, when we talk about playing suboptimally, it's in the context of trying to win a game of Commander that we're playing suboptimally. That was a great clarification. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, so some of the ways that people <coughs> might play non-optimally, we are going to start with one that I think is probably the most dangerous example because it's actually suboptimal in both categories. It doesn't optimize your win rate, and it also does not optimize people having fun. And it's spite plays. <laughs> yeah, we talked about we, we as we were talking about examples of when people might play suboptimally, suboptimally. Uh, this is one of the first ones that came up. Uh, yep. And it uh, and like Kelton said, it, it's one that uh, I'm going to jump to the end here. It's one that we don't really endorse, and that's no. because it really doesn't optimize in either category. Um, and it can also be hard to define a little bit of like what a spite play is. So we want to go over potentially some examples. Um, but yeah, like Kelton says said, it's it the problem with spite plays is it usually ends up bad for you and your opponent and makes potentially both of you feel bad, right? Yes, exactly. So some things that may qualify as spite plays, uh, you know, you won last game, so I'm going to knock you out first. You already got to win. So I, I don't I don't want you to win again. Yeah, and I think... Spite play? I think that's a spite play. I think yeah. there there is some merit to taking in your experience from previous games when you're playing against somebody, but most of that is contextual in you played this deck before... And this is a combo piece. I know it is. I'm going to remove yes. it or something like that. Being able to respond to a deck because you know how it plays, but not over-indexing and saying, you're a dangerous player. I need to get rid of you first. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Here's another one. You killed my commander, so I'm killing yours. Yes. I'm going to say that as a spite play, though I do think there may be some nuance here. We're going to talk it here in a little bit about the idea of... of you know, pointing removal at different people so it's not always at the same people. And I think sometimes if all things are equal, you have removal that you need to use because of a trigger or something like that. If all things are equal and someone removed your commander, then that probably puts a bigger target on that commander. Sure. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think in the context that that choosing someone's commander because they targeted yours is equivalent to rolling a dice or flipping a coin to see whose commander you remove. That doesn't feel like a spite play. Yep. If someone removes my commander and there is a talk drill on board yep. and I remove their two mana commander, that feels like a spite play, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm not clearly targeting like the biggest threat on the board. The biggest threat. Yep. Right, exactly. I yeah, am specifically just... targeting their commander just because you're angry at them because they removed your commander. Right, exactly. Absolutely. But Spite if play, it's don't a do roll it. of the dice and it doesn't really matter what I target, then I don't feel like that's as big of a deal. Yep. Okay, Here, here's, here's another tricky one. You are attacking me for lethal and I'm guaranteed to die. I'm going to sure. block and kill as many of your things as possible. I do not think that's a spite play, and I think that's because I consider, and I've heard other podcasters talk about it this way, and I yep. think it's a pretty good take. I consider the cost of you attacking me losing some of your attackers. So, yeah, absolutely. If it's not a smart attack, don't make it. Right. If you're going to take me out of the game, and someone can swing, and you're going to die on the crackback from someone else, then that's your own fault, and I'm going to block all of your stuff, and you're going to lose the yep. game with me, right? Okay, here's a modified version of that. Okay. You're swinging at me for lethal. I'm guaranteed to die. And so I'm going to use all of my in-hand removal on your creatures. That one is a tough one because I feel <laughs> like it also ventures to some degree into the realm of king making. Mm, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, if I have stuff on board that I can clearly block with, I... It feels kind of like a spite play to me because you're going mm. out. It feels like a spite play, especially if you target something of someone that wasn't attacking you as you're going out of the game. Yeah, so that actually feels worse to me. So I should use the things in my hand as I'm going out of the game, right? I don't... I disagree. So, okay. So, player know. A is attacking me for lethal and I'm going to die. If I use my removal on player B's creature... That's worse. That is bad. I, no, no, no. That yeah, is, I'm talking about not on player A, though. Like, I should still use... And, and part of this, I do think, comes down to the cost of attacking. If you attack into me with open mana, you do have to expect that I have something in my hand. 
Yeah. Right? That's a tough one, man, because it was not going to make a difference, <laughs> like, to what degree, like... Like, maybe? you're dead either way. You know yeah. you're dead either way. I know. It's tough. That one. That one's tough. I think yeah. I would probably not, just mm. because it wouldn't make a difference. And if it's, like, a king, like, that turns kind of into king-making, and it wasn't clear to them that, like, you had... Remo- you know what I mean? Like, it's not that they're clearly yeah. leaving themselves op- wide open. It's that... Like, say they're attacking with, like, vigilant creatures, right? Uh, like, they're not clearly leaving themselves wide open for a crackback. Um, yeah. That's so hard. Does, I don't know. I think there's a gray area on this one. That's tough. Yeah, that one's yeah. really tough. Do, do a vibe check on this one. Before you do it, do a vibe check on the table. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I think, like, the overall conclusion here is that we don't think spite plays are a good reason to play suboptimally. Nope. Don't do it. S- but what are some good reasons to play suboptimally? And yeah. I think the first one of those is spreading the love. I attacked you last time, so now I'm going to swing at someone else. Yeah, and this is something that we actually do a lot in our play group. And realistically, it is it is not very optimal. Optimally, you would target down a player, knock him out, and that way you can 1v2 the rest of the players. But that's not that's not a fun way to play the game. No, absolutely not. And that's one one thing that has moved me, moved me away from playing like Voltron decks sometimes mm. is because that's what that's the objectively the optimal way to play Voltron decks, right? Yeah. Is have one less person interact with you, take someone Because out. commander damage matters, and you can't spread commander damage. Like, you do, like, once you've got someone halfway on commander damage, you need to finish them off with commander damage. Yeah, I mean, you can you can <laughs> spread the love with commander damage. Oh, uh, but, but it's so dangerous. It's then you have so multiple dangerous. pieces of removal coming at you. For sure, because yeah. all of a sudden, you're the threat to everyone, and one hit to everyone can kill them. Yeah. And so... You're the player getting taken out, and so it's it's for me it's been less fun of an archetype to play, yeah. um, unless there's like some sort of like fun sub thing that's going on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I think I do think this is a pretty decent reason to play like to play suboptimally. That's typically how I play. Is I'll unless like there's a clear optimal attack for me, I'm yeah. pretty open to like spreading the love to. Yeah, try and keep people's life totals like relatively even. And this doesn't only apply to attacking either. It also happens with interaction removal. It's like, oh, you know, I removed your thing last time. I don't want to just keep targeting you down. So I'm going to pick a different player to interact with. Yeah, yeah. I think the one exception to this is like clear open attacks or clear on board threats, right? Again, if someone's got a tox rail on board, I'm not going to be like, well, I already removed your (laughs) Muldrotha. Get rid of the tox rail. Right, exactly. Yeah, I do think threat assessment has a lot to do with with playing suboptimally or playing friendly, Mm. uh, making friendly plays. Like, you can be friendly, but only to an extent. And and I think we are going to talk about that a little bit more um, later on. But absolutely, threat assessment just has so much to do with this topic. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that later. But I, yeah, I, I, hundred percent. I think threat assessment is one of the things that makes people have hurt feelings the most. Is like sometimes poor threat assessment. Actually, which yeah, kind of weird to say. But no, it is. That's really interesting. And one of the things you mentioned earlier as another way to play suboptimally is king making. Yeah. Yeah. So what is king making? It, uh, I think where we see this the most is there's three players out left. So like one person's been knocked out and you have no, you know that you are not going to be the winner of this game. You have no chance of winning this game, but you could knock out the winning player and give the the other remaining player the, the win. Yeah. Player, player a is in the head is ahead. You're not going to win, but you make it so that player B wins instead. Yep. This is very frowned upon in things like CEDH. Um, Mm -hmm. although sometimes is inevitable, right? It's largely acceptable in casual commander. Is it okay in general? I think yes, because sometimes it's just, it's like, it's unavoidable. Like you have to interact with somebody to stop them from winning. And that leaves someone else open for the win. Right. I feel like it's also part of the sociality of a multiplayer format where late in a game, there may be one player that's really ahead and the rest of the players are teaming up to try and take down the person who's in the lead to prevent sure. them from winning. And that inevitably, it, whether, whether it's like really clear that it's king making because right. one person, you know, throws themselves in front of the bus to, to stop player A from winning. Or it just like there's incremental advantages that are being given or, or someone is incrementally overextending to try and stop some way from winning and that gives the other players a, an advantage maybe an unseen advantage sure over them it's just something that happens i think in a multiplayer format 
Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I'm going to redact my previous statement in that like it's unavoidable. <laughs> and that's because I think for something to be king-making, it has to be clearly king-making. Mm. Because we're not playing a game of perfect information, often if someone's going to win out from somebody else after they've been stopped from winning, especially like in CDH, they have it in hand, and you have no way of knowing that, right? Whereas sure. I think a real king-making <clears throat> scenario is, we're talking about like combat damage, for example, is someone attacks into me, and uh, maybe not someone attacking into me, but I, like, oh, I don't. This, this is a tough example. Maybe I remove someone's anthem or whatever, mm-hmm. and that means they can't win. But it mm. means I can't win also. But it means the third person will win. Sure. And it's, uh, but and there, I, there. I was gonna say there is a part of key making that does feel bad though. You mentioned it earlier. Like if it's a spite play, if it's right. like you're winning and you really ticked me off earlier in the game, I'm gonna self destruct. And take you out with me right. and give them the win. And that does feel bad. Yeah, I think I can feel really bad. But I think when there's imperfect information and someone just happens to win afterwards, yeah. even though maybe you could assume they might, uh, it doesn't feel as bad, but still yeah. can feel kind of bad. I think my favorite analogy is like playing Super Smash Brothers. Like, I really <laughs> like playing one on one Smash Brothers, but for yeah. but free for all is like the like the casual fun way to do it, right? Yeah. And that's how Commander works. And sometimes you're going to have a guy who's sitting in the corner playing Samus, just charging up their gun and just taking pot shots at everybody, and they end up winning because you know what? <laughs> no one, everyone's too busy that, trying to not get them, right? I get it. As a hero main, if sure. no one's messing with me, then I, you know? Then you're hanging out in the corner? I'm hanging out in the corner charging my B and just mm. seeing if there's anyone I can pick off. <laughs> Not for me, man. <laughs> Not for me. I'm in it. I'm in it, it to. I'm in it to brawl. I'm in it to I get in your it. face. That's so funny. But again, like to some degree, it is probably unavoidable, and I think is probably an acceptable uh, form of playing suboptimally. Though, I think try to avoid it if possible, especially yeah. if, it, if it starts to look like it's a spite play. Right. Yeah. Uh, another way. This I I really liked your point here. This is something that you brought up in our earlier conversation. Is Power levels and salt levels. And so in this conversation, you might be thinking, it's dumb. Why would you ever play suboptimally? You should always take the best line. You should always give yourself the best best chance at winning. But in reality, if you're not playing CEGH, if you're playing casual commander and at, at a power level less than max, <laughs> right. then you're already playing suboptimally. And that started with deck building. Right, yeah, when you intentionally don't include like a Rhystic Study or a Mana Crypt or a Jeweled Lotus or whatever in your deck because it feels like too strong, you've intentionally played suboptimally at the deck building level. And what's wrong with then taking that same mindset into an actual game of Commander and playing suboptimally with the lines you're playing, right? It's. I. I. Though I do understand, right? Like, sometimes sandbagging feels bad. I think where, what this boils down to a lot of the time is maybe you're playing too spicy of a deck for the table you're at. And, like, yep. playing suboptimally there and, sand, like, sandbagging, and sandbagging. F- feels bad. That feels bad. bad. Right. And so, I like, really nailing the rules of your conversation is, like, can avoid a lot of this. And then it becomes, like, fun because you're playing optimally and also playing friendly and trying to like remove the strongest thing at the time. Right. Versus just like shutting everyone down and no one gets to play because I brought a gun to a knife fight. Yeah. I mean, that's why we talk about power levels in every episode. It's why we did a series on power levels. It's because power levels are so important. It's something that's really helped us in our games to make sure that we don't have non games or games where we're having to sandbag or just, totally pub stomping on a right. table and and <laughs> a lot of that can just be fixed with good real rule zero conversations and power levels do you do you feel like i i feel like we generally over the last few times that we've had you know big commander nights we've done a good job of splitting up the tables where we're like this table's low this table's mid this table's high we've or we have multiple mid tables and a low or something like that and do you feel like it's generally worked out pretty well I I do feel like it has. I feel like we got feedback maybe last time that someone brought too low of a power level deck to what they thought was a mid power level table. Yeah. But it was a deck they'd never played before, right? Yeah, and, new deck. Yeah, exactly. And I had a hard time knowing 
how mine performed. Like I played Tana and Tevish for the first time in a full play group, and it actually yeah. turned out being a five player game, which is also just like an entirely Yikes. different ball yep. game than normal, yep. right? Um, but I, uh, I after the game, I felt like I had to ask several. Like, did that feel okay? Like, I felt like I did a <laughs> lot in that game, you know? Yeah. But it was just kind of the nature of the deck. Like, it wasn't like I was running the table necessarily. I just was getting a lot of value. And mm-hmm. it never felt like I was too far ahead, but I did feel like I needed to like double check with people, right? Yeah. So I do feel like we've done a fairly decent job of that. And I think people need to play their decks maybe a couple more times to be able to know like if they're like what power level their deck is at to appropriately evaluate what table they should be playing at. Yep. I like that. That's great. So our last reason for uh playing suboptimally is letting people do the thing. And like we said, if you're playing the same power level, hopefully you're like interacting and everything is, you're doing everything kind of in a friendly way and dealing with the biggest threats. But sometimes you just have it all, right? You just have all of the answers. You can just stop everyone from playing and make sure no one's generating any value (laughs) and you can just run away with the game. And that's like not very fun. Right, that can that can turn out to everyone has a non game and you ran away with it. And even if you win the game, I for me, even if I win the game in that moment, unless I'm playing like really high power or CDH, and that's like the point. And I think mm-hmm. that's a good caveat is this does kind of scale with power levels. Is you yep. maybe stop playing a little as friendly there, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to no. win that way, especially at a power as a cat at, at a casual pod. No, I I've, I've had that, and some you know sometimes decks just do that. I was I remember a game where I was playing a precon. I was playing the um, I think a bright palm is like actually the commander for the deck, but I play Shalai and Halar for that precon. Mm-hmm. And I remember I had the nuts draw. I mean i I had I think I presented a win on turn five or six with that deck. Yeah, and I was playing my Garth deck, which at the which wasn't <laughs> yeah, optimized was all like mid high, but it was like pretty good at the time, and yeah. I was like. This is a precon that just like ran me over. Yeah, I just I just had the nuts draw. And and so sometimes decks do just just run the table and and do the thing. And and maybe sometimes you can feel good about that. But I I totally feel the same way as you, Spencer. Like if I if I'm just like, well, I had everything that game and I stopped you all from playing, you didn't get to do a single thing, and you just had to sit back and watch me do it. That's that is not a fun social experience for me, even if I'm winning. Yeah. But also, if you let people run rampant, they're going to win the game, right? Yep. So, like, to what extent should you let people do the thing versus preventing them from, like, running away with the game, shutting them down, stopping them in their tracks? Yeah. This it's, one is really tough because yes. the margin of error can be so thin, especially for certain commanders. Um, one that our, our friend plays pretty frequently in, in our in our play group is Esther the Masked, which is a Planeswalker commander. I'll read this one. One green white blue for a three loyalty legendary planeswalker estrid her plus two ability is plus two untap each enchanted permanent you control uh her minus one ability is create a white aura enchantment token named mask attached to another target permanent the token has enchant permanent and totem armor and then the minus seven ability is put the top seven cards of your library into your graveyard, return all non-Aura enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield, then do the same for Aura cards. <laughs> yeah, so... It's a heck of an ultimate. Yes, and this is what I... So we played a, some games earlier this week. I played against this. It was in the five-player game, so things get yep. a little hectic. But I pretty early, after we played Estrid, had an Assassin's Trophy in hand and the mana to cast it. Yeah. And... I really was wrestling with myself of, do I just remove Estrid before he gets any value? Because he was enchanting his lands. He's about to get double his mana on his turn. He's yep. casting... Uh, I mean, Enchantress checks just get out of control. He's going to draw a card for each enchantment so he casts. Yeah. And so I really was struggling with, do I remove Estrid or do I let him kind of get some value out of it before I remove it? And then it was too late and I we had to pay like 15 mana to attack him with any creature. Mm-hmm. He His enchantments had shroud it just things got crazy and yeah. i was so you, myself, so you chose not to remove it. i chose not to and i was yeah. kicking myself thinking maybe there was a bigger <laughs> threat that was going to come out later and it turns out in his deck estrid is the threat right and you need to yep. make sure you deal with that and that but it, it can feel so bad especially early, early in the game if he has nothing else going on and he's done all this setup to finally get his commander out and then you remove it and then they get to do nothing for the rest of the game so it's such a it's such a hard 
Wine Dwag. And I know this deck in particular, I've played this deck against this deck plenty of times in non five player pods, in regular four player pods. And this is the type of experience that you get with probably Enchantress decks in general, but this deck in particular is like, if you don't deal with it early, if you deal with it early, it can feel bad. <laughs> but yeah. if you don't deal with it early, it becomes very difficult to deal with later on. Yeah, for sure. And I think part of my bias with this one is he had built it as a budget deck previously and it yeah. kicked our butts at budget yeah. night but i wasn't playing a budget deck against it and so i think i was still operating as if i was playing a non-budget deck against against a budget a deck. budget deck and yeah. he's put a fair amount of upgrades into it at this point yeah. and it and it kicks butt it's really good so it awesome. um yeah it's but like you said it's really thin margins for error and it feels bad to get blown out by somebody and be like oh i could have dealt with that why didn't i do it but sometimes yep. it can feel worse to like shut people down and make it so they just can't play the game. And in our last play, uh, not play group, our last last time we played, you had an experience that you chose again to not interact, maybe in a way that you felt like was yeah. optimal, and it kind yep. of bit you in the butt, right? It it did. Yeah, it probably wasn't the right play. So what what was happening is I was playing Brago, uh, King Eternal, and. I was playing, one of the decks I was playing against was Yargle and Multani. I'll read Yargle and Multani. Um, there's, a bunch to there's a bunch to read. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a, it's a tough one. Three black, black, green for an 18 6 legendary creature, frog, spirit, and, and elemental. And then there's a lot of flavor text on the yeah. card. <laughs> yeah. So the, the point of this deck was. <laughs> To have an 18-6 and then do things like fling it at people and sacrifice it for value for, you know, power matters cards and, and things like that. So kind of a fun deck that I was playing against. And I I also, I think what I forgot, what I didn't realize was I had a Coveted Jewel. Mm -hmm. And Coveted Jewel is a six mana artifact that when it enters the battlefield, you draw three cards. It taps to add three mana of any color. But whenever one or more creatures an opponent controls attack you and they aren't blocked, that player draws three cards and gains control of Coveted Jewel and they get to untap it. So uh, I played a <coughs> Grasp of Fate, which is a cool card in Brago because you can reset it pretty frequently. So it's one white, white. And when it enters the battlefield, uh, you for each opponent, you exile up to one target non-land permanent that player controls until Grasp of Fate leaves the battlefield. So I played Grasp of Grasp of Fate, and I looked at each one of my opponents, and I and the Yargle and Multani player pretty much only had Yargle and Multani out. And so I said, I don't want to remove your commander because then you have nothing to do. And and I know the whole strategy of the deck is built around having this 18-6 thing out. So I didn't remove Yargle and Multani. Well, uh, someone removed some of my board, and then my shields were down, and... Of course, I just get hit in the face <laughs> for for 18 damage so that they can take the Coveted Jewel because they needed to draw the cards. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know that they actually needed to draw the cards because I think they played, like, a Disciple of Bolas, like, immediately afterwards yeah. and drew 18 cards. But it was the right attack. Out of the all right the attack. attacks at the table, you know, you got to swing somewhere and it was the right attack. So I definitely paid the price for not for play, making the friendly play and not removing Yargle and Multani. I should have just thought about it a little bit more and realized I was leaving myself extremely open, especially with a Coveted Jewel on board. Um, but yeah, that was an example where I made the friendly play. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And like, he's playing in Golgari, so maybe he has something to remove the enchantment, right? Remove the Grasp of Fate. And I, I think there's always a degree of, well, maybe they have the out for it, right? But it yep. was the friendly pay play in this in this situation because the deck revolves nearly entirely around Yoga Matani. I'm sure he has other things to be doing, but yeah. the value of an 18-6 is pretty huge, right? Yeah, and I do have to say, like, I worry about Grasp of Fate a little bit, in Brago specifically, because I can just hit everyone's commanders every turn. So when, when I cast it, I, I didn't remove people's commanders for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. I was choosing other value pieces that they had because it feels bad if you're just like, okay, I remove your commander. And they're like, okay, well, I don't want to exile with Grasp of Fate, so I'll just put it in the command zone. And mm -hmm. it's like now they have the tax and they play it again. And then I do it again. I just blink Grasp of Fate and do it again. So um, I do worry. I try and play Grasp of Fate specifically in that deck a little more friendly. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I think that's, I think that's a fair way to play it. Yeah. Um, 
I think the answer for if you're getting targeted with Grasp of Fate is just don't put your commander back in the command zone because and eventually... find a way to get rid of Grasp of Fate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Eventually <laughs> maybe someone will get rid of Grasp of Fate. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I think... I mean, again, an example of letting someone do the thing, right? You were trying to let him do the thing with Yarlil Motani and you end up, ended up getting punished. So I think there's some degree of it being okay to let people do the thing but you also have to stop it before it gets out of control or before you get severely punished yeah. or else that it, also it turns out bad. an 18-6 gets out of control very quickly. Yeah, it gives you <laughs> brings you down to less than half of your life total if you've taken any more damage and gives yep. you three more commander damage to take. Yeah, like, if he had pumped it at all, I just would have been dead. Yeah, he just kills you. He just kills yeah. you in that moment. And he didn't, and he might have been able to. So Sure. Good yeah, on him maybe it was a friendly just, play on his part. Yeah, yeah, good on him for not just like murdering you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, to some degree you've got, I think it's fine to let people do it. And I think it's right. I think it's right to let people do some of the thing. Um, mm. and I think this comes down to threat assessment again, but Kelson, so if I'm playing against Brago, right. And yep. I want to let you do some of the thing, but I need to stop you before it gets out of control. What does that, what does that look like? Right. Because yeah. one of my primary concerns is if I let you do the thing with Brago, it at all, it does get out of control or you, I mean, you, you churn through the deck a lot. You draw a lot of cards. Yep. And if I let you do the thing, you're going to draw cards and find interaction. And then, well, I'm just out of luck. I can't, now I can't deal with Brago, which would look like for me removing Brago, right? Yeah. Yeah, so some some of the things where I think, some of the places where Brago can get out of control is with card advantage, like you said. Coveted Jewel is one of those. And I think even in that game, I had Coveted Jewel. I copied Coveted Jewel. I had Phyrexian Metamorph. <laughs> Right. as a copy of Coveted Jewel. I was drawing so many cards in that game. So I think drawing cards is one of the times when you need to shut down Brago. Otherwise, you can just accrue such... I had a Thought Vessel out, so I wasn't discarding cards. Like, I I accrued a ton of advantage in that game. So that is one of the places where I do think it is appropriate to shut Brago down, and you don't have to feel too bad about it because, uh, you know, drawing cards wins games. That's that's one of the areas. And then there's a couple, there's a couple of other, um, like, big threats. So... Uh, I think specifically on card draw, Displacer Kitten and Coveted Jewel actually are like a mini combo. Sure. And provide a lot of value there. So that's something to watch out for. But in terms of like actually closing out the game, it's going to be something like Kappa Cannoneer and mm -hmm. being able to make a large unblockable turtle <laughs> that uh, people can't stop very easily. It's got Ward, so it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, and then there are there are ways to make a lot of golems or mirrors or, you know, pick your artifact creature. Um, there's a lot of there's a way to make a lot of tokens with Brago that can get pretty overwhelming. So places where I hope I can get enough value before Brago gets removed are like playing enough mana rocks to be able to have enough mana to rebuild and to play Brago again, or to be able to have created a few artifact creatures, you know, maybe four golems or something like that. Sure. So I don't just have a totally open board to swing into and it gives me a little bit of a buffer, maybe a turn or two to try and get back into things and start rebuilding. Right. Yeah, I feel like I feel like what I'm hearing is that there's got to be some level of threat assessment, right? Of knowing, mm -hmm. hey, what are some combo pieces in Brago or whatever yep. deck I'm playing against, right? What what are if they're playing any sort of combos, even if they're not infinite combos, like what is generating them a lot of value over the course of the game? Like yep. like big card draw engines or what have you. Big mana engines. I think card draw is scarier than big mana engines because yeah, you're seeing more cards and will find <laughs> the big mana engines, right? Yep. Um, and uh, and maybe timing, right? Like I think one thing I think about when I'm trying to interact with Brago is you're playing blue, so I'm waiting for you to be tapped out at any point. And so maybe that means you swing with Brago once. With that, with that Brago trigger on the stack, I'm removing Brago. If you've tapped mm -hmm. out already in the turn, right? Because sure, what I you let me get the trigger once, right? But before it untaps my mana rocks, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to potentially remove Brago because if it untaps your mana rocks and you just pop off that turn, then yeah. like you're leaving. There's no chance you're not leaving mana open for whatever counter spells you might have drawn. And again, that deck yeah. doesn't play very many, I think. But no, there are versions of the deck that do. <laughs> Yeah, right. totally. And so, which is why power level and knowing the deck that you're playing right, against right. is really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I I liked what you mentioned there. A threat assessment, like we said before, has so plays into this so much, and just like knowing. So I think, like you said, part of that is just getting better at recognizing what cards are actually going to win someone the game, and when you should say, "Okay, I'm done being friendly." 
you're going to win the game if this continues. I need to stop you. So uh, you mentioned you mentioned card draw and, and card advantage. So like Kindred Discovery, that's a card that you just need to take care of. Yeah, I think when you play Kindred Discovery in a game, you're going to end up winning with some other piece, really. right? You're going to end up winning with a giant yeah. creature that you find. But what won you the game, it's Kinder Discovery. And I think yeah. that's important to recognize when you're playing against any deck is t- engines like that or six or whatever are things that you should be removing because those are going to, even though it f- might feel bad, I think it takes both you recognizing as an opponent that is going to win them the game and you recognizing as a player, like, this wins me the game and this is, like, I, this is the biggest threat that I'm playing right now. Uh and I think that's when it feels the least bad, right? To have something of yours removed is when it's yep. clearly like the biggest threat on board or the biggest threat that that you are playing in the moment. Yeah, right? yeah. Because as the threat reduces, and and, and uh, as the threat reduces, it becomes murkier and murkier to know if that's if that's the right thing to remove. If right. It, if it's if it's the biggest threat, right. I think a really good example that you came up with this is Scoot Swarm. So Scoot Swarm is two and a green for a one one insect creature it has landfall whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control you create a one one green insect creature token but if you control six or more lands you instead create a token that's a copy of skew swarm instead so it's it becomes kind of exponential <laughs> yeah so if someone plays skew swarm and they have now remind me it's six sorry i was listening, six but, six or more yep someone plays skew swarm on turn three they have three lands probably don't need to just like bolt the skew swarm in that yep. moment right but they play Scoot Swarm and they have six or seven lands already, or they've already gotten a Scoot Swarm trigger, you probably want to be dealing with Scoot Swarm at that point, right? Because it actually gets way harder to deal with the longer you let it go, yeah. right? Because if, if they've made one copy of it, then now you have two copies you have to deal with, so targeted removal doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I think a good way to think about when it's maybe the right time to interact and when it feels the least bad is... That there's a point of no return with a yeah. lot of things, right? With Brago, it's you've played like six mana rocks and now you're blinking all of them. And like, and or you're you've blinking, drawn a you're ton drawing of cards X amount of cards, whatever. right? Exactly. Yeah. There's a point of no return where I can no longer interact, or it takes all of us interacting multiple times to try to stop you from doing whatever you're doing. Yeah. And with Scoot Swarm, a board wipe's gonna solve it, and that's about it at, at a yep. certain point, right? And if you don't have that, then you probably should spend whatever you have on Scoot Swarm before they get to six, but maybe not way before because it's going to take them a little while to get to six. And yeah. Might be other and the one ones aren't a problem. No. And there might be something else that comes online in the meantime, right? Yeah. That you want to have your, your, your interaction saved for. I think the other area though, which comes down to knowledge <laughs> is a known combo piece because mm-hmm. alone it may not look very scary. Um, but if you know that there's a combo in the deck or you just know how the combo works, then you probably need to remove the combo piece. Yeah. Again, I feel like this can also come down to timing. Uh, I mean, one of our examples here is, is like Displacer Kitten, right? Yep. Displacer Kitten is the <laughs> from Baldur's Gate, the, the best card out of Baldur's Gate, yeah. even though it's maybe not the most expensive because it just it breaks so many cards. It's three and a blue yeah. for a 2-2 creature cat beast with... Avoidance, it's got a cool name because it's from uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which I think is sick. It says, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, exile up to one target non-land permanent you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. Yeah. So it just lets you get accrue a ton of value. Lots of infinite combos are built around Displacer Kitten. Um, but even a Displacer Kitten that doesn't have infinite combos will generate a lot of value. Yeah, and so, I mean, it's still a combo, yeah. even if it's not infinite. Right, exactly. So that one is worthwhile removing, worth removing. But also, like, there's a point of no return, right? I think typically you want to wait till the last possible moment to remove something. So yeah. if you play Displacer Kitten and there's nothing it combos with, eh, you're probably fine. Something's coming down that Displacer Kitten will interact with, now's your time. To, yeah. It's now or never to get rid of Displacer Kitten. Displacer Kitten, Kitten is hard, too, because it just provides value. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, you, you don't even have to have that big of a combo for it to be good. I think one interesting combo is Heliod Suncrowned and... Uh, um, walking Ballista. Walking Ballista, thank you. Mm-hmm. So Heliod Suncrowned is two and a white for a 5-5 five, five legendary enchantment creature. God has indestructible. As long as your devotion to white is less than five, it's not a creature. Whenever you gain life, 
you put a 1-1 one, one counter on a creature or enchantment you control, and then you can pay 2 mana to give another creature life link until end of turn. So Walking Ballista um, is a creature that you can remove 1-1 one, one counters from to deal damage. So you give it life link, and then you deal you remove a counter to deal damage. That puts a counter on it, and you can just repeat back and forth. Have you ever seen Walking Ballista in a deck that didn't have Heliod Suncrowned? Um, no. Oh, well, yes, but it's because it was with other combos, right? Walking yeah. Ballista is... <laughs> A great combo piece. I think people yeah. can play Heliod Suncrown in like a life gain deck, right? Yep. That's I think you can totally do that. This one's really tough because yep. it's most of the time not a creature. So Hard it's an indestructible enchantment. And so yep. you need something that'll exile Exile an enchantment. Yeah, which is you've got there are those are pretty few and far between in a lot of in most colors. Um Yeah. This, this is one though that you can see coming. Yeah. Like, you're, you're going to see the walking blister, and you're like, well, <laughs> I know, I've seen this song and dance before. I know what happens now. And you can kind of wait. Like you said, you can kind of wait. There, yeah. There, there's, there's a longer period of time before someone actually plays the Heliod where you're like, okay, now I'm going to remove your walking blister. Whereas, like, Displacer Kitten, it's like, well, even if I don't remove it before they get the combo, they're still getting value off of it. Like, there's got to be something to blink that's yeah. going to give them value. Yeah, for sure. For those who don't know, I think the time to interact with this is you, you're you not going to be able to interact with Heliod for the most part. You've got to hit the Ballista. Yeah, the Ballista. Yeah. Which is hard because they can activate it in response to being targeted. Yeah. If it is have, a difficult to interact with it, combo. It is a tough one. I think you inter- when you interact is when they pay the mana to give the Walking Ballista lifelink. And then you, mm-hmm. with that on the stack, you say, nope, Walking Ballista's gone. Because yep. then they can't remove the counters and start the loop like yep. on top of you. Yep. Anyway... Point being, threat assessment is very important, and I think we actually didn't talk about this before, but I do think threat assessment is, like, it comes down to threat assessment being what makes people feel bad. Poor threat assessment can make people feel, and maybe we should do a full episode on that. We did a little mini episode here, but it can can feel really bad if you are threat assessing poorly, whether that's from, like, historical information or spite plays or what have you, and you deal with something that either someone doesn't consider it as a threat or they over index on they it. They over yeah, they, I think I think it's important to make good a threat assessment both as against your opponents but also for yourself to recognize I played a toxical the corrosive. I'm not going to be mad if someone removes this because it's a toxical the corrosive. Yeah, but how bad does it feel if like your your opponents all have much scarier stuff than you and someone mm-hmm. removes your thing and you're like what are you doing? I'm so far behind everybody else. This is obviously not the biggest problem. You feel targeted. Yeah. You feel like they made a decision, a suboptimal decision on their part to target you specifically for some reason. Yeah. And that that's where I think some of the hurt feelings can come from. For sure. I actually remember, I think I did this to you one time and I apologize. And I had a friend, <laughs> I had a friend playing my Will Help the Rock Cleaver deck and they played Kinder Discovery and uh-huh. I used some of my removal, I think, on like one of your enchantments that I was worried oh, about. Funny. Like a like a teleportation circle or something. And you were playing your Brago deck. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, to some extent, you and I get to play Magic a lot and we play against each other a lot. So if all things are equal, I'm usually pointing something at you instead of another player. Yeah. Um, just just to be friendly. But Kinder Discovery is one of the cards that we talked about that probably should be removed. And that is like a part of threat assessment. Like that that is one of those engine pieces that you really do have to get rid of. For sure, yeah. for sure. So what are some solutions to potentially balance playing friendly and playing optimally? Mm-hmm. Uh, because part of the fun for me is playing optimally <laughs> and interacting at the right time. And that can often blow people out, right? That is just... Yeah. And it feels good sometimes because you're like, I you used my, your removal on my thing, guess what? It has hex proof, and or yeah. you're playing a giant enchantment on your creature. You're putting an. You spent, on the, mana, you spent you the mana. You spent the card. Yep, boom! Your creature's gone. Like that feels really it good, fizzles. and also yeah. feels really bad for the other player. But it's like the right play. So how do you balance that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we came down to, probably the the best way to not only make them feel better about, <laughs> or not only to feel better about making sub Wow. Suboptimal play. Yeah, to say. <laughs> that is hard to say. Thank you for also stumbling over it, so I don't feel as bad for having stumbled over it several times already. Suboptimal plays, but also to get more out of suboptimal plays is politicking, which makes me happy because that's one of my favorite parts of Commander. Yeah, it was so funny. I'm not a huge politicker, but yeah. this is as we were talking about this, it felt more and more clear that politicking 
really can really does balance playing friendly and playing optimally, right? Like yep. if we jump back to your Brago, Grasp of Fate, Yoggle and Multani example, if you play Grasp of Fate and you say, hey, listen, I know I have a Coveted Jewel on board, which I think looking back, you didn't have on board at the time. I think you like drew into it or whatever, or whatever. But even without the Coveted Jewel there, right, as an extra temptation to attack you, you were going to be tapped out. You were going to be open for an attack from Yoggle and Multani. If you say... Listen, I will not grasp a fate, Yargul and Multani, if you promise not to swing it at me next turn, because I don't want to take nearly 20 damage in a yeah. single hit. Then, all of a sudden, the suboptimal play of removing Yargul and Multani feels actually like an optimal play, because it's not hitting you, and they still get to do whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. And, it, and I could grasp a fate it next turn. Exactly! <laughs> yeah. You're not bound by that <laughs> indefinitely. You're bound by it for a single iteration yeah. of it being blinked. And so, and he's also not bound by, like, he might remove Brago instead, right? There's, like, yep. there are loopholes, which is kind of the part of the fun part of politicking, and you still get to try to play <laughs> optimally and, and yeah. twist it to be in your advantage, which I think is... That was really a fun. massive oversight on my part uh, in that move, and I, I do really like politicking. I'm, I'm upset with myself that I didn't catch that one. <laughs> that was a good opportunity to politic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and... Say he's like, no, I'm attacking you. Then you're like, well, guess what? Yargul Matani is getting removed because I yep. gave you a chance to politic and you decided not to. And I like politicking really lets you coerce your suboptimal plays into being more optimal, both for you and another player. And I think it makes Commander really fun. And it's something that I don't do nearly enough. I am often too in it to win it and just like, I'm going to play optimally. I'm going to win through the merit of my deck building and my skill as a player. You, in a four-player game, that's going to happen 25% of the time. <laughs> yeah. You've mentioned before that whenever I politic in a game, you, I, you, you, generally, try and, you generally try and prevent it. Oh, for sure. I spread anti-Kelton propaganda <laughs> as often as I can when Kelton is politicking because I'm like, guys, Kelton has stuff in hand. He knows what he's doing. He's not a dummy. He's not just... <laughs> not that anyone who politics is a dummy. I think politicking is great and smart. And you need to be also really careful when you're accepting deals. I think giving deals is when you have the most power. Oh, absolutely. You've got to be careful accepting deals because people are getting stuff out of it. Yeah, I do, I, I do worry that we're making politicking sound shady. And it's mm -hmm. not. It's very yeah. much a part of Commander. It's 100%. how it's supposed to be played to an extent, right? And, and it's good to politic. And I also, one of the things that I like... Which, once again, don't be shady about it. Like, <laughs> don't, don't, don't be mean in your politicking. Be use politicking for good to to better your suboptimal plays. One of the ways that I really like to do it is to have table talk and discuss things with the whole table. Mm. So, uh, going back to the grasp of fate example, later in the game when I used grasp of fate again, I said, okay, you know, what are we most worried about on player A's board? What, and and as a tape with the other two players discussed, what do we want to remove from their board? And then went to the next one. Okay, what do we want to remove from their board? What's everyone else worried about? And collectively, the other, you know, me and the other two players decided what to remove from their board, which makes everyone else feel good about a little bit better about helping you make the decision, but also makes the person who's getting something removed feel like, okay, yeah, everyone is worried about that. It's not just this one person targeting me down. Right, exactly. And Grasp of Fate is a perfect example of that because you yep. hit everybody. You're yes. not just picking one person's thing. It's symmetrical. It's symmetrical. <laughs> For, For my everyone opponents. but you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and to some degree it deflects blame from you, right? You're like, yep. you're not removing someone's thing. Everyone else is. You just cast the spell. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that makes politicking sound shady. It's really not. I think when politicking is shady is when you are a big fat liar and you're going against the politics yep. and you're saying, I promise I wouldn't attack you, but I'm attacking you anyway. Yeah, that's not good. That's not cool. But I promised I wouldn't attack you, but hitting you with a lightning bolt, that's fair game. Sure. Right? Or removing your thing so you can't attack me. Right, exactly. Yeah. I think I think there's lots of merit to politicking. I should do it way more, and I think I would win more commander games and help people have more fun if I did that more <laughs> often. We'll get you. We'll get you there. All right. So the next thing here is to care more about your game plan and less about interrupting other people's. So this yeah. is something we've been indexing towards pretty heavily uh, uh, Kelton and I in our deck building, and this probably came out of our uh, deck building and power levels discussions. Yeah, and that is just caring more about protecting your game plan than disrupting other people's 
game plans. You you that doesn't mean that you can just take out all the spot removal and board wipes. You still need those. Those are important to the game functioning and you not losing every game. Right. But <laughs> more and more of the interaction in our decks is becoming protective. Things like counter spells or things like heroic intervention or other cards that give your game plan some sort of protection. Yeah, for sure. And that might be some recency bias from me in like the most recent deck that I built, which was um, Tana and Tevish, and I want to protect Tana, right? It's I want a little Voltron-y. Make, yeah, a little Voltron-y uh, to some degree. I know I said I hate Voltron, but this is different, you guys. It's not a Voltron deck. <laughs> it's Voltron um, value. <laughs> and and like part of the reason I really like playing blue is like I like playing counter spells, not because I like being the permission deck and controlling everyone's gameplay, but it lets me leave up mana every turn to be like, I think my stuff might be safe. Like I can keep my yeah. stuff alive if I need to. And it's nice if sometimes they double as, well, you're casting a giant Torment of Hailfire. Just kidding. Yep. That's not happening. Yep. Um, so play blue. Again, it's the best color. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I, but really caring more about your game plan is, can, can help with that, right? Is if, and yep. that, you can't always do that, right? Sometimes you're playing yep. a, a style of deck that doesn't support that, and you're not going to be able to keep up, and you have to play a little bit controlling. Yeah. And that's okay, but, but just in general, I think the idea is that interaction should prevent you from losing, not prevent other people from playing the game. Yep, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, And the last solution yes. that we have here is to care more about your friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, this is obviously a little tongue-in-cheek, but ultimately we are here to play a game, and we are playing to win, but the bigger point is to have fun. It's a casual format. Yeah, it's the most fun when everyone has fun. If you play board games with people, it's the most fun when everyone has fun. If you're playing, you know, video games with people, it's the most fun when everyone has fun. It's fun to win. Not everyone can win, but everyone can do something cool and have fun playing. And that's why we're all getting together to play Magic. So, yeah. care more about your game plan, politic, and <laughs> care more about your friends. <laughs> care more about them having fun also when you're playing Commander. I love it. Well, yeah, like we said at the beginning of the episode, we'd really love to hear your thoughts on when you might play suboptimally in a game of casual commander. Uh, that's going to be everything for this week. Thank you all so much for listening. We appreciate your support so much. Please like and subscribe. Get notified when we post our weekly content. Uh, and we might be trying to drop some shorts uh, interspersed between our, our weekly content if that's something that people would be interested in. So uh, we hope to see you next week. Yeah, we're trying to move into short form content. Please look for that when you're when you're doom scrolling through YouTube. We're trying to do that a little bit less, but uh, maybe hypocritically, we're going to encourage you to do that to find our content and support us. Uh, check us out on the Commander Pod. We're going to be working uh, in short order uh, in the next couple months, hopefully, which you know is short order, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, to get more content onto our website. Uh, thecommanderpod.com thecommanderpod.com in the form of power levels and our um, our documents on power levels and things like that we're going to try to distill that information in more than just the medium of our videos and uh, again thanks everyone for listening we love you all comment like subscribe and until next time remember to always play the